Welcome to the 259th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I'm glad to bring writer John Mualam to COVID Calls for a discussion of his new book, This is Chance, The Shaking of an American City, A Voice That Held It Together. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live most weekdays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions of future guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. And I just want to underline that I do still get um, suggestions uh, from people who'd like to come on and talk about their research or about others that they'd like to hear from. So please keep those suggestions coming. Thank you. As of today, April 14th, 2021, there are 2,961,963 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. The death toll in the United States from COVID-19 is 563,449 lives lost. In Kenya, 2,394 have died from COVID-19. And in the state of Alaska, 300 have died from COVID-19. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic. I'd like to continue that now. The headline is obituary Robin Njogu, obituary Robin Njogu, Kenyan radio legend, gentle giant and friend gone too soon. This is by Isaac Swilla, written for Citizen Digital and appeared March 17th, 2021. Human life is precious. And it hurts most when those taken away from us are people we cherish. Simply put, since Monday night, March 15th, at around 11.15 p.m., when news filtered through that my boss and friend, Royal Media Services Radio Managing Editor, editor Robin Njogu, had succumbed to COVID-19 after a brave battle spanning four weeks, my heart sank. I was crushed to the bone marrow. The news was devastating. It is terrible. It hurts. I sat alone at the dining table late into the night, trying to come to terms with the degree of my loss, the loss to Njogu's family and the loss my employer RMS had suffered in Njogu's demise. His death shocked us all, the RMS management and we, the team he led in the radio editorial department. In the natural scheme of things, people lose hope whenever their loved ones are admitted to the intensive care unit wings of hospitals. However, for Njoku, we held our collective hope that he would recover and join us at work to do what he loved most, fact-checking, breaking news, and sending news alerts. And there was every hint that he could win the war. To me, his battle with COVID-19 was just but a passing storm. The pain gets even more pronounced when I roll back the clock four weeks ago, when he first broke the news to us radio editors that he'd been unwell and that his doctor had recommended a COVID-19 test. Three or so days later, on the same platform, the radio editor's WhatsApp group, he confirmed that he'd tested positive and that he was under treatment. As usual, we wished him well, urging him on. I didn't panic, and I can't think any of my colleagues did. This is because several RMS staff had tested positive for the virus since the first case was reported in the country, in Kenya, in March last year, and they defeated the virus. Most importantly, we got encouragement whenever we paid him a visit at the Aga Khan University Hospital where he was admitted. On that visit, there was no much, there was so much engagement with him as he lay on his hospital bed. He had his face down, he was on a ventilator. However, his sense of presence and ability to twist his arms to acknowledge our presence gave us assurance. His spouse, now widow Carol, was particularly upbeat telling us he was getting better each day. In fact, Carol said Njogu would be in better mood when he, whenever his colleagues from work paid him a visit. This gave us the strength and determination we needed. 
Mathomi particularly made it a personal duty visiting him at the hospital nearly every single day and keeping close contact with Carol and in turn keeping us all informed with the latest developments. Second visit happened exactly two weeks ago on March 3rd. This editorial appeared in March, which happened to be in Jogu's 45th birthday. The team, together with the HR department, decided that since it was his special day, there was need to make it memorable for him, his hospitalization notwithstanding. To achieve this, the team rallied, raising cash. The response was thick and fast, showing the love the team had for Unjogu. Again, together with Buthomi, RMS HR manager Philip Owinga, and Unjeri Ungugi, we drove to the hospital to present the gifts on behalf of the team and to wish him a speedy recovery. We ordered a cake baked with a microphone-shaped design on the face of it. This is because Unjoku, throughout his professional career spanning over two decades, had dedicated his life serving as a radio journalist. The team also bought a small digital radio. The plan was to have the radio switched on in his hospital room and have an anchor in studio wish him a happy birthday live on air. At the hospital, we found our boss, HR Director Rose Wanjohi, patiently waiting for us together with Carol and a few friends. Carol, his spouse, had become so much acquainted with the hospital staff thanks to the long period Unjogu had been indisposed. On this day, we found Unjogu seated, not on his bed, but on a chair with the ventilator on. The hospital crew was very cooperative and supportive too. We sang him happy birthday and showed him from the safety of the glass wall, the presents we brought him. Though he couldn't talk since he was on a ventilator, he looked strong and acknowledged our coral by stretching his right arm across his chest, a gesture of gratitude. Carol, a humble and appreciative soul, was moved to tears, thanking us in RMS over and over again. Rose later led us in a word of prayer and we left the hospital happy and upbeat that our warrior, the towering yet gentle soul, would soon be out. If hope, goodwill, and unwavering support heals, then Unjoku would have made it out of the hospital. Throughout his sickness, I witnessed firsthand the love and outpouring of goodwill he got from RMS leadership and his fellow colleagues. Upon his demise, tributes have poured in, his peers hailing him for his work ethic and professionalism, something that I witnessed every day. In retrospect, he helped fight the virus with distinction, dedication, and brutal commitment through rich, accurate, and factual information to radio listeners through the news bulletins, earning himself a state commendation award. Sadly, it is the very virus that he worked so hard to fight and campaigned against that claimed his life. In pinning this piece late into the night, when every member of my household has retired to bed, I mourn a man who was not just my boss, but a friend. In venting this out through the pen, I hope to eliminate the pain, anguish, and boiling anger and to find solace and strength to face the future. To the good Lord, I say thank you for the opportunity of having known and worked with a gentle soul. Fare thee well, brother. The piece was titled Robin Unjogu, Kenyan Radio Legend, Gentle Giant and Friend Gone Too Soon by Isaac Swilla, written for Citizen Digital, appeared March 17th, 2021. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today, one that I've really been looking forward to a great deal. Let me introduce my guest. John Mualam is a longtime writer at large with the New York Times Magazine and a contributor to numerous other radio shows and magazines, including This American Life, The Daily, 99% Invisible, California Sunday, and Wired. He's frequently talked about his reporting on radio and television shows, including Fresh Air, Radio Lab, The Colbert Report, and at the TED conference in Vancouver. Occasionally, he collaborates on live storytelling and music, pro music projects with members of the band The Decemberists. John's most recent book, This Is Chance, tells the story of the 1964 Great Alaskan Earthquake and radio reporter Jeannie Chance. The Wall Street Journal praised the book as a powerful, heart-wrenching book, as much art as it is journalism. Amazon BuzzFeed and Brain Pickings selected This Is Chance as one of the best books of 2020, and it's now being in the process of being adapted into a film. His last book, Wild Ones, was chosen as a notable book of the year by the New York Times Book Review, The New Yorker, NPR, Science Friday, and Canada's National Post, among others. He lives on Bainbridge Island, which we'll hear about, next to Seattle. And during the pandemic, he's primarily been a father. Also, he tells us he's built a fence. John Mualam, uh, thanks for your time today. Welcome to COVID Calls. 
Thank you so much. It's uh, I'm really, really glad to be here. I just really admire the work you've been doing this whole time. So it's it's great to be part of it. Well, it's an honor to bring you here to talk about the book and all the other projects that you, you have going. And uh, let me start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling from, what the pandemic situation looks like there, what the vaccination situation looks like there. Yeah, so Bainbridge is a um, community of about 25,000 people right next to Seattle. It's, you know, in the before times, it was a commuter uh, place uh, primarily and, you know, big retiree population as well. Um, it's been a really, I mean, as sure everywhere has been a very interesting place to be in a pandemic um, because of its, you know, peculiarities. But, um, you know, we were right, uh, you know, in the first wave of the U.S. cases that were in and around Seattle and maybe had some early cases in the community as well. Um, and But since then, the Bainbridge in particular has been you know, impacted, but relatively, you know, stable and, and because of a variety of factors was able to keep things under control. Um, the vaccination stuff has been um, its own story and maybe we can we can talk about that in more detail. But um, yeah, there's been just a massive volunteer effort here on the island to, um, we're about to do our, our 20,000th dose this weekend, which, you know, in a community of 25,000 people, all those doses aren't just for residents of the, of Bainbridge Island, but, um, but that's a, just a kind of an outsized um, effort. I think that the county health department has done just about the same number of doses overall. So, um, so yeah, so that's going really well. Um, and uh, there is a sense, you know, knock on wood, like, you, know, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to look back and feel kind of hubris, but I think there is a sense in the community right now that, you know, we're, we've turned the corner and that if we can do everything right from here on out, um, you know, it should be a, a, a good summer, um, which is mm -hmm. sort of, you know, in, in the Northwest, uh, the, there's sort of everything always builds toward the summer anyway, you know, you survive the winter and then you get to enjoy a few months of summer. And that's a very, very real sensation this year in a way that, you know, is, is pretty profound. When, when you e express this idea that people have a, a sense that maybe you've turned the corner, I'm curious what that looks like there on Bainbridge. I mean, I've been like others. I mean, I'll share I have this feeling that as things open up, it's going to be almost the inverse of how when things shut down, which is it was so disorienting. Hmm. And I think it's going to be, I wonder how disorienting it will be to people to all of a sudden be speaking with masks off, to be in, in yeah. restaurants and bars and those kinds of things. How's that kind of pre-freedom communication working there in Bainbridge? Yeah, that's a really fascinating question and one that I've been thinking a lot about also because my wife, who's a psychologist and works in the community with a, especially with a lot of, um, you know, teenagers and, and young people has been actually gave a one or two talks about that to various community groups of just sort of what, you know, what the literature says about, um, you know, young people and trauma and what can be expected. I don't want to speak on that because I'm not an authority on it, but it's just something that's, you know, just coming up at the dinner table and stuff. And I guess the first thing I'll say is I, you know, I can only speak about it from my perspective, um, which is fairly limited. You know, I'm, it's not a, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a city, you know, I'm not interacting with tons of people every day. And uh, most of um, where I've seen people is I've been working at these vaccine clinics every weekend. Um, so that's most of my contact with the, with the world outside my own family. And maybe it's just a function of being there in a space where there is a lot of, you know, you're actually doing something productive and you're working with other people, you know, often for the first time, you know, in, in a year, you're in a room full of people all working together, doing something. And I think the energy there is absolutely, you know, communicating that. But, you know, I also see that, you know, we're planning a, a birthday party for my for my seven year old daughter right now. You know, it's going to be, you know, 10 kids at most and it's going to be masked and outside. But it's a it's a big turn from, you know, her birthday last year. Uh, I know people are, you know, talking about, uh, you know, taking trips now. And um, so I don't know, I think in, in a community like this where it is easy to keep distance from each other and there's been a lot of sitting in people's yards and people have the space to accommodate that that sort of interaction. I don't think it's it, it wasn't sort of turned off like a spigot in the way that it might have been in a place like New York. So I'm personally hopeful that it won't be as jarring to suddenly, you know, turn it all back on because the truth is, is that the on of social life in a community like this is not so overwhelming to begin with. Mm -hmm. But you know, I could be wrong and and we'll see. Um, I definitely I feel a little rusty in terms of uh, being a, a sort of person in the world. So. 
we'll all have to get our small talk skills back with with living people right next to us. It's interesting you talk about the, um, and I do want to talk more about the vaccination here in, in a few minutes. Um, I talked with Lucianne Walkowicz, uh, astronomer at the Adler Planetarium a few weeks back, and she had a similar experience. She talked about getting her first vaccination and the sort of um, pep and excitement that the staff brought to it. And even though people had trepidation in that moment, um, that that was, she felt like some kind of a, a tell that things were different now. And it, it seems to resonate a bit with what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, I could go on and on about that. I mean, the truth is, is that, you know, I had a pretty disorienting year, uh, you know, last year, personally, like, you know, not that that makes me unique, but um, but I, I definitely, you know, was working through a lot of just psychic, uh, you know, disorientation. And uh, the vaccination on the island here started, I think, right around Christmas. I could be I could be wrong about that. And I went to volunteer for the first time, I believe, on like January 5th or 6th. Um, and I remember being uh, pretty frightened, you know, just like showing up and, you know, like triple checking my mask and, you know, I brought like water and vitamins. I don't know what I was, you know. And uh, and as soon as I got there, um, there was just that energy of, of feeling like, you know, for the first time since this had all began, you know, I wasn't, I didn't feel really able to contribute in any meaningful way. You know, I, most of what I was doing was, um, you know, the most, the most sort of valuable thing I was doing was, was being a, a father to my children. And that's, you know, unfortunately kind of a thankless task. Um, mm -hmm. And it, you know, I, I'm not uh, some savant at parenting either. So it didn't look very, uh, didn't look like I was a high achiever in that, in that category. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just to be in a room where I felt like, oh, wow, like, you know, there's a, there's a team vibe. Um, you know, it reminded me, I used to work at a butcher shop and it sort of reminded me of that. It's just, you're sort of all in this room, just mm -hmm. getting this thing done. And there's yeah. just a great, a great energy that, that comes from that. And it's just been growing and growing since then. I want to just make sure I once again, let people know about this book, your most recent book. This is Chance, the Shaking of an American City, a voice that held it together. And um, I read a lot of disaster research books. This is a phenomenal book. John, I hope everybody will will get it. I think it's just come out in, in paperback. And let's start by talking about the book. And there's so many connections to the pandemic to think with here. So this book is a story of Jeannie Chance and her work as a broadcaster in Alaska. And she also turned into a, a kind of a improvised public information officer in the middle of the 1964 Alaska earthquake. How did you discover Jeannie Chance? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a really long way to tell that story, and I'll spare you that. But the the short version is basically, I started um, looking into the story of this uh, tsunami that had hit uh, the town of Crescent City, California, in 1964. Um, I'd been to Crescent City years earlier, and it just there was something about the story of that community that kind of captivated me. And I started poking around online, and uh, of course, the tsunami was had been caused by this uh, the Good Friday earthquake in Alaska. Um, which I had never heard about. I don't know what that says about, you know, me and my education, or, but it, it just, it was not on my radar as a historic event. Um, and one of the first documents I found, or one of the first really valuable documents I found was this, uh, almost like an oral history uh, that Jeannie Chance had compiled on her own. Um, I think she later submitted it to the USGS as just like, here, take this. Um, but it was uh, interviews with hundreds of Alaskans, uh, all recounting you know, what had happened to them in the four and a half minute duration of the earthquake. So the quake lasted four and a half minutes. Um, and it was just account after account. And at the very uh, beginning, there was this very dry um, author's note that said, you know, the author is was a radio broadcaster in Anchorage who stayed on the air for 59 hours the weekend of the earthquake. And uh, her family recorded uh, many hours of the broadcast. And that was it. And uh, you know I'm a I'm a journalist, so when you hear that there's some kind of information or doc, you know some sort of material out there that probably no one has seen, you, you know you get very excited. I'm sure it's the same for uh, for uh, people who do who do your kind of work. And so yeah, I just started tracking down those tapes, and it really became obvious very quickly that because of the situations that Jeannie found herself in um, during these sort of three days after the quake that I'm that I'm chronicling in the book, she became this perfect lens to tell the whole story because so much of the story was passing through her. Well, let's talk a little bit about the earthquake itself. And, and just to give one line from the book, um, you talk about this occurred March 27th, 1964. Um, you say the earthquake overwhelmed people the way the strongest emotions do. It was pure sensation coming on faster than the intellect's ability to register it. Uh, the, the, 
section there where you talk about the experience of the earthquake, her own experience and, and others, um, is really arresting. It's terrifying, um, actually, I found. And I wonder, you know, how you compiled those different, Jeannie gave you some breadcrumbs to follow, but you compiled other, other stories as well as people were trying to make sense of what was happening. Yeah, I mean, that was the one thing I found was that, of course, everyone who, you know, both who has uh, had, uh, you know, given any interviews or had there was any documentation about it at the time, but also when I found survivors now, the thing that everyone remembered was how they spent those four and a half minutes, right? <laughs> so, um, and that was, you know, even that reading that first document that I described that Jeannie had compiled, that was really what grabbed me with this story right away was that feeling of disorientation where it was actually, you know, it took moments for people to even affix the word earthquake to what was happening. Um, and I've never been in a, in a large earthquake like that at all, like nothing even remotely as powerful. Um, but I have been in, you know, a few, a handful of like some very small earthquakes uh, when I lived in the Bay Area. And I related to that even in those kind of momentary jolt earthquakes where it's, you know, it's, it's over before you knew what happened, right? Because we don't expect the earth to move, <laughs> you know, it's, um, and that to me was the really salient detail about all of this. And what became sort of a theme for the book was just um, the improbability of that kind of disruption and how there are things that we take for granted as stable that we don't even, we don't even think of as, as stable. We just think of them as, as being there. And, and that those things can, can just dissolve or, or start shuddering underneath us. One of the things I really like about the book is that you weave social science concepts in seemingly, I know there was effort, it feels effortless, like a term like normalcy bias in this, in this concept. So how does a concept like that play into what you're writing about? Yeah, I mean, that was, I was, uh, you know, my experience writing, you know, journalism and, and history like this is always that it's amazing when you are trying to describe something and then you realize that, you know, someone has spent their career, you know, perfecting the, a rubric for, for um, yeah. I, you know, kind of encapsulating these, these phenomenon. And that was exactly the case where I couldn't figure out, you know, what I was reading, but I, I sort of detected that there was this pattern where people were almost like excusing the earthquake you know, is trying to brush it aside. And, and Jeannie's experience was a, a perfect example where, um, you know, she was, she was, uh, you know, looking at a, at a building collapse and she thought, okay, well, you know, I guess that building's collapsing. That's the big news story today, you know, and it didn't occur to her, well, if that one's collapsing, you know, certainly others are too. Um, so yeah, when I, we, you know, we can talk about how I sort of came to the, to the research too, but um, it was really a process of, of finding that there were words to describe these things um, that I was reading in these very intimate, personal ways in, in the accounts. It was almost like the opposite of um, the research itself, where you collect the account and then formulate a hypothesis. I was just sort of like had these loose ideas about mm -hmm. you know, these things seem similar. And then lo and behold, there was a word that, you know, um, brought them all together. I, for maybe what's the hundredth time I reread John Hersey's classic book, Hiroshima, recently with students. And one of the things, I'm always finding new things in that in that book. And um, one of the things he talks about is that survivors in Hiroshima didn't have a frame of reference for what had happened to them. And so they reached for whatever other sense-making tools they had. And in fact, in Hiroshima, it took a long time before they knew exactly the nature of what had happened to them. Um, in Alaska, as, as you describe it, it, even in this four and a half minutes, there's a time compression there, but still takes some time for people to begin to name, as you as you were saying, what had happened to them. And I think it maybe others didn't name it in, until a bit later. What When they tried to make sense and they didn't know it was an earthquake, what did they reach to? What kind of preconditions yeah. did they latch on to to try to understand this world that's moving in front of them? Yeah, I mean, ironically, one the more obvious um, answer to some people was nuclear war. You know that um, there yeah, was a of course. really big um, military presence in Anchorage at that time. It was uh, had always been this presumptive, you know, Soviet target, and so that was people's you know, a lot of people's first um, guess. You know, oh, this this sound of the earth churning that must be the growl of a of a nuclear bomb. Um, and then you know, and then the spectrum goes all the way from that to uh, oh, it's the wind. You know, <laughs> which is you, know, you test that one out. It doesn't it doesn't hold up for very long. But that's where, you know, Jeannie's mind went, for example. Um, and then there was just a kind of a bafflement um, where there, there was no 
um, you know, I, 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 one really memorable account was a, a woman was driving. Uh, well, there's a, a one one man on this on this particular road was was driving and thought it was he had just bought a used car and thought it must be falling apart. Another woman on the road just didn't couldn't even get that far and just thought, why is the road not? Why won't it stay still? You know, what's wrong with the road? So yeah, um, yeah I mean, all of that just seemed. Um, I don't know. You know. There's just something so poignant to to watch people's mind kind of hurtle through those those um, contortions, um, and and to me that spoke to a kind of um, you know, there's something universal about that. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily have to be something as epic as an as an earthquake. I think we we kind of walk around uh, in, in life trying to just um, you know kind of keep our understanding of the world somewhat narrow and, and and swatting away things that don't don't fit in with with that. Right. And in Jeannie, you found a person who, in that moment, um, did a number of quite extraordinary things. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about her experience over that over that weekend, people have to read the book to get all of it, but um, she really jumped into action. Yeah, I mean, this was the great gift of, of identifying her as sort of a way to tell the story because um, not only was she really central in the story itself, but she had left behind just a tremendous amount of documentation that really allowed me to like reconstruct her days, you know, at, at times it was minute by minute. So yeah, so Jeannie was a, a working mother with three young kids and a part-time uh, reporter for uh, an Anchorage radio station called KENI, and her role, which is which was pretty extraordinary for a woman broadcaster at that time, was um, she was a, this kind of roving news reporter who had a, a mobile radio unit in her car and would report from all over the city in the greater Anchorage area. And uh, so when the 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 quake stopped, she was actually in her car with her son at the time. As soon as it stopped, she she kind of snapped into action, like you're saying, because she this was her job, and she had a way to report on what happened. Um, and so, you know, she first went to the, the police station and she saw some furniture turned over and she thought, oh, wow, like the quake was strong enough to turn over the furniture and that was going to be her news story. And then she saw this building collapse and it just sort of progressed on and on until, you know, she's seeing dead bodies. She's seeing, um, you know, uh, the main thoroughfare of Anchorage. Half of it was sort of sunk into this giant crevasse um, and the, the, the escalation of the damage. Um, just kind of unfolded before her eyes in that first 45 minutes or so. Um, and so as soon as she had done this quick little tour, she went back to the radio, to the police station and offered her uh, mobile broadcasting unit to the authorities and just said, here, like, we're back on the air, you know, use this. And didn't really see herself as, as having any role to play other than, you know, as a reporter. And very quickly, um, you know, she was sort of just thrown in charge of, of, as you said, a public information officer where she was relaying messages, you know, both coordinating recovery efforts, like we need a doctor over here, there's a gas leak over here. Um, also, um, you know, getting information uh, out to the public because radio is the only way um, of communicating with the city at that time. And she uh, stayed in that, in that role for, for most of the next three days. Uh, with very little, you know, time, uh, you know, off duty or resting. I think she took a, a couple of hour and a half, you know, naps where she claims she barely slept anyway. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was this um, really interesting case of a of a person who, you know, was even uh, refusing to uh, see herself as having any real important role to play, and and had to very quickly awaken to the fact that you know this was this she was invaluable, you know. Um, and that was that was a really cool thing to see documented throughout the course of the the weekend. I was really fascinated to see the importance of radio too, and uh, for this community, but for Alaska more generally. And then at some point, she starts fielding calls. I think the first one, somebody says, "Hey, I'm in Nebraska. What's going on there in in Alaska?" And then she gets a call from London. So she's now all of a sudden also serving as a sort of a news service for the rest of the world too. Yeah, there were there were some. I mean, there were very few lines of communication open between Alaska and and the lower forty eight for about the first you know twelve or fifteen hours after the quake, and uh, you know both by dint of her you know um, you know kind of persistence of getting in the situation she was in and her skill at doing it well, and then also just pure luck. She happened to be the person who was answering a lot of those calls or who people were asking to come on the phone. Mm -hmm. London called, someone came to Jeannie and said. London's calling. Will you talk to them? Yeah, right. Uh, 
And yeah, and her, you know, I, the the most like surreal uh, bit for me was that her boss, the owner of the radio station, was um, sort of on this goodwill tour of uh, Japan at the time with other Anchorage businessmen. And when he gets wind of the earthquake, you know, he switches on the radio and he hears Jeannie's voice, you know, talking to him in Tokyo. Um, so yeah, that was something she ended up feeling very uncomfortable about the degree to which she became elevated as this. You know, she was called the voice of Alaska um, because she knew quite well that she was not the only, you know, very hardworking radio broadcaster that weekend. But it was absolutely true um, and it really elevated her to this kind of uh, almost like folklore hero status for a while the other role that she found herself in and i was really struck by this part of the book is uh, she's handed notes uh, for family members looking for family members or co-workers looking for co-workers and of course, my mind immediately stopped to september 11 and the you know placards that were up everywhere and the many different forms of broadcasting, formal and informal, that were doing that same kind of work. I mean, the minute I read that sentence, John, it, it transported me back to that moment. And it, that must have been incredibly stressful for her to have that weight on her shoulders. Yeah, I think it I think it really, you know, at first, I think it was it really wrecked her, you know, like, I think the first the first people, it wasn't even people handing her notes, it was people showing up at the police station in person, just very distraught. And I think I could be wrong, but this is what I believe the first people that came was a couple who lived in in this you know sort of upscale neighborhood in in Anchorage called Turnigan, which had a big portion of it had just sort of sloughed into the sea when the the ground liquefied under it, and these houses were just shattered, you know, lying on the coastline. And this couple lived there, and they knew that their kids had been home alone. And I, I believe those were the first people who came to Jeannie and said, you know, we're looking for our kids, and asked her to to put that message over the air. Um, and you know that. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly how she described it at the time, but it was she was clearly like you know really distraught by that, um, and went ahead and did it. And then you know within a few hours, they're doing dozens of messages like that. You know, an hour, um, they're literally saying, "Okay, Jeannie, what do you got?" And she's got like you know twelve to fifteen new um, messages to do. So I think in some ways it it, it became um, you know normalized in a way that it was hard to sort of think about each one of those people you know, being a story, being a family that was that was separated. And then on the other the other hand, you had people who were fine, who were trying to get messages to people, you know, saying, you know, to, if my wife is listening, I'm okay, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so there's this sort of yin and yang of, of dislocation. And then uh, you sort of, we get the narrative of of the earthquake and then pretty soon, and this is where the, the book is too much of a spoiler, I don't think, um, the sociologists arrive. Yeah, that's an unexpected plot twist for a lot of people. Not for us disaster researchers who yeah. know this story. We're reading it, thinking, "When is Corn Telly going to get there? When is Corn Telly going to get there?" And lo and behold, he arrives, and you spend a lot of time with them in the book. So, for those who are not familiar with the story, what does it matter that a bunch of sociologists from Ohio showed up in Anchorage after this earthquake? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I will I will um, preach to the choir here while I've got the choir watching. But um, yeah, if I they're, they're, they're listening, a big part of me that thought, you know, if I could do it over again, I'd be a you know critical disaster studies uh, a PhD, you know. And uh, I just I was just I found this whole field just completely fascinating. I mean, I knew a little bit of it before I had started the the book project. I'd read um, Rebecca Solnit's book, Paradise Built in Hell. And then I think when I when I started on this book, I think it was actually in the, the the citation in that book that led me to your your book too, to just kind of you know get a sense of the the history of the field. Um, and I just I just found it you know like the idea of of trying to study essentially chaos in a in a methodical way, um, just something about my personality type really really found that you know like that's that's a cool sweet spot to be operating in. So yeah. Uh, but the truth is, is, is I, I did not understand until, you know, I, I sold the book with a proposal. Um, and, and at that time I did not, I knew about the disaster research center. I knew that they had this archive of, um, interviews from, from Alaska. I, I had actually been through Delaware, you know, just in an afternoon and just kind of scouted it out and seen a couple of those transcripts. But I didn't I didn't expect that the researchers themselves were going to be characters in the book or that, you know, I would be telling the story of the work. I just saw it as a trove of material. Right. Um, and then when I when I um, when I got, you know, spent some more time there at, at the Disaster Research Center and I was reading these transcripts and and they were just really vivid. You know, you I, I realized I was I wasn't just reading people's accounts. I was reading uh, 
transcripts of conversations and that the people asking the questions had their own perspective on what was happening, their own, you know, expectations and assumptions. Um, so I'm sure I don't need to, you know, go into the, 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 the overview of it too much, but yeah, these, these, uh, this team of sociologists had arrived in Anchorage, uh, on Saturday night. So just a little over 24 hours after the quake. And, uh, it was kind of, um, I don't, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but it was like uh, almost adorable the way they just mm. began rolling tape and just asking the most, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, like the, the specificity of, you know, okay, tell me what happened at 5.37 PM, you know, mm -hmm. and these Alaskans who are, you know, still in the, in the throes of, of a kind of disruption are just, you know, can't answer these, these questions about who told them to, to you know broadcast this or who told them to help dig people out of the rubble they were just sort of saying like i don't know what are you going to do you know you go dig people out of the right. rubble and that whole dynamic was what leapt out to me when i was reading these transcripts between the sort of way that um you know this this work kind of led you right um, i mean i was thrilled i was like oh my god these are the people i read about in rebecca's book and they just walked right into my book you know this is fantastic right. Right. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was such a great surprise and such a delight to get to, um, you know, tell that story in, in the, in the latter half of the book too. So you mentioned the cold war as a frame that people had when they were trying to make sense of the earthquake. And of course that's the same frame that the disaster research center is operating in. That's how they had the money to jump on a plane and get to Alaska within 24 hours. The, um, federal funders were interested in knowing what would happen to communities in nuclear war. And because they didn't couldn't study that directly, um, they were studying things like earthquakes. And that case became a real foundational one in social science research about disasters. Maybe you could say a little bit about, as you're reading them interact in that community, the kind of social science questions they were asking and what they were finding in that moment. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's why I felt such an affinity for the field. I don't think I explained that too, too well just before, but I, I think that was it, is that they were asking exactly the kinds of questions that, that I was asking of these documents, um, but they had a, a much better vocabulary and framework with which to ask them. So yeah, they, like you said, you know, these were really supposed to be proxies for studying the aftermath of a nuclear war. And, you know, the expectation you know, although there had been some work by Charles Fritz before, I don't think it wasn't really very widely known even within the field. And so there was still this conventional wisdom that, you know, you were going to be dealing with looting and violence and disorder and mayhem and antisocial behavior. And it really quickly became apparent um, when you read these, the very first interviews they're doing that, that they were not finding that and they, and they knew it, you know, right away. Um, so yeah, what they were finding was um, this, you know, kind of collaborative, altruism and this ability of, of individual people to just step up and solve whatever problem they saw in front of them, or at least attempt to solve it in very constructive and industrious ways. Um, and, and that there were many people like Jeannie, you know, who did not see themselves as having any kind of heroic role to play, but who ended up doing, you know, really phenomenal work. And it's sort of interesting because as a journalist, I think, you know, a lot of the kind of playbook that that I would follow in a in a magazine story would be to tell a uh, you know a kind of intimate story about individual people and then kind of step back and say you know how is this indicative of of something more universal and often that's when you go to academics you know you go to the literature and you try to contextualize the the specifics that you've seen in something um, more universal and here was amazing because the people who do that were actually on the ground you know in the right. story doing it in real time. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very cool to have a, you know, I felt to have a book where you, you are reading this very, you know, narrowly focused, you know, kind of action driven story. And then you get to find kind of understand it all slowly in, in the end and what, it, and what it all means. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking today with author John Mualam about his new book. This is chance, the shaking of an American city, a voice that held it together. So with all of that in front of us, then, as the pandemic is breaking out, and you're one of many um, writers I've talked to in COVID calls who who have had books and other projects sort of in the either in the works or out or promoting while the pandemic is breaking out. So you've got this other story of a disaster, and now we have the disaster that we're living with right now immediately your mind must have been sparking thinking about the symmetries and connections between those two things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, without a doubt, I mean, the book, the hardcover publication was March 
4th, I believe. So, you know, from about March 15th, I think I was supposed to go to New York on March 15th and do a bunch of pre-publication stuff. And um, so, you know, the months before it sort of all building toward this. And it was really interesting in retrospect, I think, to um, I was actually looking at some old emails the other day and it was it was interesting for me to, you know, look back at sort of like, you know, I don't claim to be like prescient in any way, but but I definitely feel like I, having spent six years writing this book where, as I said, the theme was sort of like anything is possible, you know, like more than you think, even in, in bad ways. Uh, you know, I definitely was a little more, um, you know, pessimistic about, you know, as we're talking about, well, are these these events going to go forward, you know, or and, and I kept saying, like, I don't know, guys, you know, to my publisher. And, you know, also, I think because I was in Washington State, where it was a much more kind of visceral, you know, proximity to the to the virus. Um, so so I think that was just one thing that I was conscious of. I don't know that I have any great conclusion about it still. But one thing that I was conscious about was just that I was watching in real time a kind of normalcy bias take hold. Um, and, you know, um, you know, I remember at one point having a conversation with either my publisher or my agent and, and they were saying, you know, we're, we're, day, we're taking it day by day. We'll see how, what, whether you're going to come or not. And I said, well, I'm, I'm three weeks ahead of you. You know, I'm on the West Coast, so uh, I, you don't have to take it day by day. Like, I, you know, imagine where you're three weeks, you know, you're where I am now in three weeks. Um, so I think that that's, that's sort of really, um, that's almost like warped my worldview from now on. I think it, it's really had uh, what I think will be a lasting impact in, in terms of just being really in touch with that, that uh, reality. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, all the stuff that we were just talking about in terms of the social science definitely became um, really salient, um, you know, at the at the beginning of the the pandemic in the U.S. Because I think that you know I struggled to talk about it because I think in some ways the big takeaway from that those parts of the book is that this myth of antisocial behavior and and you know um, chaos is is pretty destructive and we have to flip it and and realize that we should assume that things will will go okay you know interpersonally and that we'll we'll be good to each other, and that was a hard um, that was a hard thing to to apply to a pandemic. Um, it still is for me. I'm sure there's lots of smarter people that that have done it done it well. But you know, just the idea that this this impulse to come together and to help had to be refracted through the strangeness of a of a pandemic, where the last thing you want to do is actually come together, right? Um, and I remember talking a lot at the you know, in the interviews I was doing then about just really just saying like we need to reframe how we're thinking about this. You know, my my. You know, when you when you say like I can't believe the NBA is you know uh, postponing its season or canceling it's like we're, it's collapsing every society's collapsing it's like no that's that's society you know um, stitching together and like being proactive and productive and we've got to you know attune ourselves to seeing these things as as um, as as good actions as 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 brave actions um, instead of as like you know this kind of unraveling. I'm really glad you said that because it's um, I've been trying to make sense of that too and. And, and maybe even it seems so far in the past now, but it's worth remembering that not just in the United States, but globally, we undertook a collective action to save lives on the scale of which I'm not sure we've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, I mean, I don't know. I, I Again, I don't want to, I don't have an expertise, but, you know, just as a, as a, um, a citizen, you know, as a, as a person living through it, mm -hmm. like I really, I was really um, upset at the time of how little, um, uh, I don't want to say celebration of that, but um, what would what would the, the word be? Um, like how how little um, you know commendation there was of that. Just how little attention there was. You know, I remember um, I actually have this still on my desktop, and I'm, I don't have a link to it because it's just a screenshot. But you know, here in here in Washington State, um, you know, Jay Inslee was you know like other governors was giving these daily press conferences. Mm -hmm. And at one point early on, he said, um, the, the, uh, it's important to minimize our physical connectivity, but it's also a moment to maximize our emotional connectivity. We know the stress of isolation for all of us, particularly people of age, is really, really troublesome, but we can do something about that. We can call frequently, we can text, we can send letters and flowers. And I thought, you know, I don't know, maybe that seemed sappy or something, but I just thought like, where was that message? You know, like where was the message of like giving us a project to do? and like a, a sense of purpose. Um, and I saw that, you know, here and there, but it, there was, and there was a lot of it, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to natter on and on, but like, even just like, I can think of two friends of mine who started doing these like daily Zoom 
things for kids. You know, one is a children's author, Mac Barnett, and he had like a daily story time. And the other, Wendy McDoughton, who's an artist, did these drawing classes every day just to like keep kids busy, you know, when their parents couldn't pay attention to them. And there were so many little things like that, but I just really felt like we were missing some kind of, you know, they, they were so dispersed that it was hard to feel like it was, it was happening. I, we needed someone to just say it really clearly out loud. And I just, I just feel like that is one of the greatest failures of, of like in my lifetime, really, you know, in terms of like a squandered opportunity that I, that I've seen. And it's just really hard for me to stomach like how different things might've gone if, if that had happened. It's interesting too. And, and, and a parallel with, with your story of 1964 earthquake that uh, Jeannie Chance and others sort of looking around, maybe they were expecting a, kind of a command and control to snap in that the military and the, and the National Guard do show up. I mean, it's not like they're absent, but that there was this sort of master plan that people were gonna pull out of the cabinet and like, oh, here's the master plan if we follow them. It didn't work that way. And certainly with this pandemic, the response in the United States and some other countries, um, it has been similar improvisation, but almost at a terrifying level. I wonder what you think about the symmetry in those two cases. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a part in the book where I'm describing, um, which I thought really it took me a while to really catch on because you know I'm I'm living fifty some odd years later, but like to really try to think about the means of communication in 1964 and how you got news, you know, and that you didn't you didn't expect to have instantaneous news the way you do now but you actually still did expect to have inst like by by the standards of 1964 there was an expectation that if something happens you're going to find out about it relatively quickly um you know jfk had just been assassinated less than a year earlier right so mm -hmm. um so so once i once i sort of started reading more about that uh there's a, a section in the book where i'm just trying to really drive home to like readers like how weird it would have been to be in the lower 48 and know that this catastrophic event has happened. I mean, literally the Space Needle in Seattle was swaying. Like people, you could tell in a visceral way that something had just happened and only be able to get these kind of snatches of information from, you know, a ham radio chain, you know, th things like that. And that it was really when Jeannie started um, making those connections to the media outside that there was some kind of cohesive um, story being told about um, the quake. And so it's you can almost equate it to like, if you only had like a Twitter feed, you know, mm -hmm. and you only mm -hmm. saw like people's uh, instantaneous personal reactions to something, um, you know, versus like going to the New York Times website and seeing, you know, a news story about it. Um, and Jeannie really was that kind of narrator, I think, both for people in Anchorage, but also for people and, you know, ultimately around the world. So, yeah, I think that that was that was something that I think was really missing was. You know, you had you did have these governors, you know, for, for better or worse, I guess, in some cases of of putting on these like afternoon, you know, shows or whatever. But um, sure. yeah. but uh, but I don't know, I guess it was, you know, I mean, it's really a function, I guess, of the federal government's failure. But um, but it just none of it really seemed to stick. You know, there was no one no one telling us like the goal and like how to get there and like and like I hope this doesn't sound crass, but like how to have a little fun with it. You know, I mean, I think that like the most mm -hmm. there's so much so many inventive things going on and. Um, like I was talking about just showing up at the working at the vaccine clinic that day, that was really the first time I felt it, you know, and that was almost a year after the fact. So, um, I would have loved, I would have loved that. And I think it would have just made a tremendous amount of difference. It, it, it is a, a difference in, in the two cases. I mean, I don't like to spend too much time talking about the former president. Um, but we don't find a lot of cases in disaster research literature where you have a high ranking official, not to mention an executive who seems to be actively going out of their way to um, slow down or disrupt the disaster response, to try to thwart collective action, to try to gum up the works. And I don't know how else to read Trump's response in the pandemic. And in, in that regard, the 1964 earthquake, there was no, well, maybe I'm wrong, you tell me, but I don't think there was a Trump figure in that moment, somebody who's actively trying to spread disinformation and make it harder for people to come together. No, not at all. I mean, there was disinformation, but it was un unintentional. I don't, I think that was really the upshot of the story. And I think that's how it stands out to my understanding in the literature was that it was this really clear, clear anecdote of this kind of cohesion, you know, where everyone really did bring their best intentions. You know, it's not to say that there weren't divisions in the community and, you know, it's the races and all the other things still existed. Um, but that in this very immediate period of the, especially of these three days that I'm covering in the book, 
um, it, it really was, you know, bordering on a kind of, um, uh, maybe idyllic is too strong a word, but it, it was, you know, it was pretty close to, to, you know, how well it could have gone, I think. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think that, yeah, in a sense, it's like we were reacting to, um, you know, two disasters. We were reacting to like a, dis a, a pandemic and then also like a disaster of, of leadership, right? That it took, mm -hmm. took like even more counterforce from, from ordinary people to just like, you know, stand against this like tsunami, I guess, to extend the metaphor in like an over elaborate way, but like there's the, the earthquake is the pandemic. And then there's these tsunamis of, you know, the kind of ripple out right. from it. And, you know, we were just all sitting there with our, you know, 3D printed face shields and hand sewn masks, just like standing against this, this tide, yeah. you know, trying to, yeah. trying to hold it back. Um, and it, it's just like, man, like, just as a parent, like, how, like, I still don't know how to explain that to my kids you know what what happened you know just like like you know just what why why couldn't it have gone gone better you know and like what do you take away from something like that i just i'll be thinking about that probably for the rest of my life so i since reading this book i've been racking my brain over this question who's the genie chance of the pandemic era the person and maybe there's not just one but the person who has the right skills for the moment, but doesn't necessarily have the job title and then steps in and performs extraordinary service. Yeah, I mean, I think the truth is, is that it's like, you know, genie chance was the genie chance of that earthquake, you know, only for about 100,000 people or, you know, a couple hundred thousand people in Alaska. And, and uh, so, you know, I don't know that there's going to be, there's going to be one, I mean, you you have your own constituent you know you're not a radio <laughs> a daily radio yeah. host right? and you have you've you've done a service to your own constituency and you know on and you know jay insley was doing it um you know to his mm. state and up and down the, the ladder i think there were probably a lot of those a lot of those people and uh, i don't know maybe that is the best that you can expect i mean i don't know uh, i'm i i don't have the breadth of knowledge you do but i don't know if there's been a you know i mean in my lifetime i i don't i didn't really see like you know, George Bush or Rudy Giuliani being that after 9-11, really, you know, or, or or after Katrina or something like that. And those are, again, were somewhat localized disasters, too. So I, I don't know, maybe something this large, there can't just be one one genie chance. To me, that's a great takeaway from your from your book. And even the way you just describe it is I think we should be looking for those genie chance characters in this time. Uh, and we need to, to go back to something you said, I think, powerfully earlier and, and really shine light on them um, and, and really get away from the idea that it was Trump's pandemic or Joe Biden's pandemic, but be looking at much more local levels to see who was actually um, doing the work and maybe in unexpected ways. I, I, not to lose the thread on Jeannie, and, and I have a couple other questions for you, hopefully you have time, um, is... Uh, what happens to her after? Because, as you said a moment ago, the normal rules of society seem to be suspended, but that's a short suspension. And then the broader structural world, structures of the world she lives in, they snap back, back in pretty strong after the earthquake is over, don't they? Yeah, I mean, even, you know, the earthquake's on Friday around sundown, and even by Sunday afternoon, you've got a, um, a kind of, um, you know, imperious a man from the civil defense agency, you know, telling Jeannie to step away from the mic and it, we're going to have press releases now and everything's going to be official. And so, so yeah, she gets sort of, um, you know, disempowered uh, pretty quickly, but in a, in a, take a kind of like a bigger, uh, you know, wider lens view of, of it. Um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it's 1964. She's a woman, a working mother in a, in a pretty conservative community. Um, and so, you know, even though she's ascended even before the quake to a kind of like improbably, you know, trusted and, and respected role in the community, um, you know, she's she hits she kind of hits the ceiling and she can't stay at the level she was in the quake. She asked for a raise after the quake and she's turned down. And so she quits and kind of strikes out on her own. Um, and, you know, I, I go into a lot of this in the book, but sort of where she ends up is in the state legislature eventually. And uh, which is really a function of her of her notoriety from the quake. You know her campaign poster. Hang on, I actually have it right here. It's uh, fallen behind my desk, but yeah, this is her first campaign poster. And uh, sorry, you can see like it's Amazing. a picture of her holding a microphone. You know, and uh, yeah, sure. that's how she sweeps into the legislature. She doesn't even have to say like you remember Jeannie from the earthquake. It's just enough to have that microphone, and she does really great work there. You know, for for about a decade, and really progressive passes a lot of really progressive legislation to help, you know, especially marginalized communities in the state. Mm -hmm. 
so she is there is a kind of like sense that you know once she once she proves to herself that she you know she didn't lack for confidence but i think she she was always sort of unsure whether society was ready for her you know and she accepted that it might not be and once she uh was able to take that kind of stage during the quake it was very hard for her to to just feel like it wasn't accessible to her anymore um, and so she did go on to have this career and then, you know, in, in the long arc of her life, you know, she sort of becomes, um, an unknown again and, and sort of forgotten to the point where like, you know, she, she wasn't really, um, that well known even within Alaska anymore. Um, when I started the book, I mean, I'd like to think kind of, there seems to be like younger people now who are kind of like celebrating, mm -hmm. which may or may not be a function of the book, but it's very, very cool to see. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to writer John Mualam today. And uh, John, I wanted to just um, touch on one of your earlier books, bring that, resurface that, uh, Wild Ones, which appeared in 2013 and was reviewed all over and, and read and discussed. And um, you write in that book about sort of the end of wilderness and um, you follow the kind of life story of three different uh, endangered species in there. There's been a lot of um, thinking and discussion around what COVID-19 tells us about biodiversity, about life in the Anthropocene, this period of time in which humans are shaping and reshaping the so-called natural environment. And so um, I wondered if you had revisited that book, some of the themes that were in that book in the, in the midst of all this, particularly earlier when there was so much discussion about Wuhan, um, and biodiversity loss there. Humans and animals coming into more direct contact, uh, not a, as a result of anything the animals have done, but as a result of the world that humans are making. Yeah, I mean, I have to confess, it's the, I guess, I, I'm, I don't wanna say like I'm over animals, but I, I think working on this this other book for so long has definitely like made me much more curious about human behavior mm -hmm. amongst other humans. But I do think that I have thought about it in terms of like, I think one big, takeaway from that that book for me and it, it probably won't sound so profound if i just you know say it in a pithy way but just that you know we are we are part of nature you know we are our actions or our inactions at this point you know it, it all affects nature um you know we we have so much power that um you know it's it, we can't just leave nature alone right um that we were sort of actively managing it all the time and if we fail to do that we're also actively managing it just in ways that we may not um, we may not like. Um, I think Stuart, Stuart Brand has a, a great line, something like, you know, people call it playing God, but, um, well, I'm going to get this wrong, but his point is basically like, we already are God, you know, so we may as well play God well. Um, so yeah, so I think that, that to me has been like a really resonant idea in the pandemic is that there's, you know, I don't think there's anything more, um, conspicuous or makes this point more obvious than like the fact that we're actually sort of each of us is, like a habitat for a pathogen, you know, and and we're and we're you know giving it to each other, um, and and the sort of interconnectedness of of ourselves and our body and our society um, with what we would traditionally you know call nature in quotes is just um, you know there's a false division there that it's um, mm -hmm. all those lines are just completely they're not there you know these lines that we imagine are not there, so um, yeah I I. I think about that a lot. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the, the question. No, it does, and it's. I think it's. You know, for me, it, 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 thank you for addressing. I mean, it just seems like in this time, when we so often want to draw a hard line between human behavior uh, and natural behavior, between human habitat and natural habitat, we're seeing those lines. Uh, blurred. And I think also there have been a couple of, you know, bats and pangolins have kind of emerged, but also other species, you know, early in the pandemic, people are out walking around in their environment, um, maybe time to get into nature in ways they hadn't before. And they're, they're saying, I didn't realize I lived so close to foxes, or I didn't realize I lived so close. You know, all these stories from March and April and May, um, in which people are rediscovering nature and like, well, it's actually, it's been there the whole time. It's just, you're at work all the time. So you don't, you don't see it. 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's very cool. I was like joking with a friend the other day that like, well, well, I'll go back to work and then the the raccoons can kind of safely come back right. to spend, right. spend their days in our houses, you know, and eat all our food. What <laughs> we right. never knew before. Um, but yeah, I think that I don't know. It's I, you know, I mean, the obvious question is like, does it have any kind of lasting impact? And like, yeah, I I don't know. But it, it was a, it's been a cool kind of alternate you know, slightly alternate reality, I guess, for, for some people, at least, um, to sort of see themselves as part of the world in a new way. There's another project I wanted to ask you about, which is you have a podcast, um, which you started before the pandemic. But, you know, if your timing was uh, off a little bit and no fault of your own, when the book came out, right as the whole world was shutting down, your timing couldn't have been better to have had launched a podcast about walking uh, just before the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about the podcast and for people who aren't familiar with it again, you've got to check out this podcast cause it's not what you, it's not what you're expecting. I'll put it yeah. that way. I should also say that the podcast is sort of on a, um, a indefinite hiatus. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, so I, uh, I, so there's plenty uh, of episodes there for people to discover, yeah, even if it's on hours high. and hours of content still still remains. Um, but yeah, the walking podcast is pretty simple. Like, you know, I live more or less in the woods. I work by myself at home alone. Um, well, not by myself anymore, but in, in before the pandemic, I was by myself yeah. um, and I would take a walk, you know, not every day, but a lot of days. And so I just started turning on a tape recorder when I left the house walking for about an hour. I took advertisements. I would read an ad in the middle of the walk and then I'd walk the rest of the way and turn the tape recorder off and there was no other talking. And uh, it was the walking podcast. And uh, so, yeah, it was um, improbably, it seemed to have a pretty loyal following, much to my surprise. It was named the best podcast of the year by a couple of uh, big media outlets. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I still, you know, the only thing I can really say about it, which is what I say all the time, is like I overthink most things in my life, and I had managed to have this one project where like I really didn't put any thought into it. And no matter how many people like you, Scott, have me on their shows and and want to talk about it, I resist sort of saying anything yeah. intellectual about it because like I just don't. I don't know. I just I'm taking I'm taking a walk, and so if you want to listen to me take a walk, you can. And I think to kind of like. Um, philosophize about it any more than that is sort of like against the spirit of the project because I just really don't have any good good answers although I've been it's been pretty fascinating to like see other people you know um write at length uh, at times about you know why why it's interesting or something like that so yeah well I, I mean I guess in that it's moved into the realm of art then I mean if it's out there in the world and people can make of it what they what they want to make and I and I respect the way you're you're describing it, discussing it, but I do have one question. Which, yeah, sure. um, which is not art. Like, which please is, don't call it art. You know, it's just I'm just taking a walk. Like, the, yeah, that's but, but it's art. It's, yeah. it's not as much about the podcast itself, but it's about you walking. Um, because I wonder, as a person who thinks a lot about disaster, when you are walking, particularly in empty spaces, does your mind go to Alaska, does your mind go, I mean, as I was listening to the podcast, I was thinking, and this is just my own twisted mind, I was thinking, this is potentially a guy walking in a place where there's no people. Is this a place where there's been a nuclear attack? Is this a pandemic landscape? And, and I think about those kind of things when I walk in empty spaces too, because I read about a lot of that kind of stuff. And I wonder, I don't want to no, no, any no, ideas on you, but to me. what do you think about when you walk, John? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, now I'm just wondering, like, is that must be what you guys think about all the time? And like, is there a support group for that? Because I, I have a different <laughs> version of that, really, where um, it really it started with the book, but it really intensified actually after I did like some a lot of reporting about the 2019 uh, campfire in Northern California, yeah, right. which is for months I was just like reconstructing this this one car's evacuation from the from the fire, and I had video, you know, all these different videos from different sources, and I was just in this fire, you know, for like months, and um, and I so the version of it that I have is is not imagining that I'm in a place where disasters happen, but just basically like looking around at, at all the potential disasters, you know, like even, even down to like, you know, there's a, there's a maple tree in front of my house and I don't really ever walk by without just realizing like, Oh, one day that thing is going to come down, you know, like it's, it's pretty healthy now, but, um, 
but it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be there forever, you know, and this kind of impermanence or this idea of, of like disruption and disaster is like very much, it's like this Google map layer kind of over my, my consciousness sometimes. Um, so I do, I do relate to that, but, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Cause also one place where I, where I walk a lot is, is, um, used to be kind of this sawmill town you know, about, you know, in the early late 19th century, early 20th century. And there's really not much left of it now. You know, the forest has pretty much reclaimed everything, but knowing that there was this kind of, you know, mm. this community there also is, I think about that constantly. Yeah. I mean, I, it's inescapable for me. It's like, I'm, I'm living in these two times at once. So, um, yeah. So from places that are, are empty and maybe ruins back to this, um, space where the vaccinations are being given out. I mean, that's kind of interesting. And, and in one day, you find yourself in both of those different environments there in Bainbridge. And that's what we started with. And maybe we should close out just saying a little bit more about this vaccination effort you've been involved with and maybe how you, I don't know, in uncanny ways, do you, do you find yourself summoning the 1964 experience a little bit, emergent groups yeah. and pro-social behavior and trying to save lives and not waiting for the playbook? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, and I would, I would actually definitely encourage you to have someone from the, the I mean, I'm really just a volunteer worker bee, you know, that's, mm -hmm. I'm not, I have no leadership role and I definitely can't speak about the effort in any official capacity. So, but I, I would, I can connect you with folks because I think it would be really interesting. Um, and again, I don't, I haven't canvassed the U S or, or the world and know whether, you know, how, um, you know, unique or, 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 um, or uh, uh, unusual this even is, but, um, I can't say enough good things about it. So basically what happened was there was a, about 10 years ago, there was a, a group called Bainbridge Prepares, which a, a guy named Scott James started in the community. And his uh, his focus uh, was earthquakes, you know, because we live in a, in a seismic area and we live on an island and there's this general understanding, which I don't know where it came from, but it seems very true that if there's going to be this big quake, we're going to be on our own for several weeks. You know, for, there's not going to be a lot of first responders. There's not going to be a lot of support. And he had the foresight to just start a group that was going to start organizing people neighborhood by neighborhood um, and wrote a book about the whole process uh, called Prepared Neighborhoods. And Bainbridge Repairs just kind of grew from there. And, it, you know, they were just preparing, you know, they were just uh, had different teams, you know, that were going to address different issues after a quake. I think they were somewhat focused on wildfires as well. And uh, and at some point, you know, they started working with the fire department and then they started working with the city itself, with the emergency manager at the city. who had, It's just a one a one woman department. Um, so when the when the um, the pandemic started, you know, there was this kind of human infrastructure in place. Um, you know, I guess it's not was it an extending organization. I can't remember the typology, but it's not an emergent organization. But um, and they repurposed themselves to kind of do this. So, you know, in the fall, they they. Um, you know, under the guise of the city, um, they were staffed a, a, a testing site at outside City Hall, um, you know, so that they could get that up and running. And then when the vaccines became available, they started doing just a very small number of doses. I, you know, I mentioned I started in early January, I think, and it was just at this little, you know, in this one room. And it was I think we maybe did like 80 or 90 doses that day. And um, to be honest, I was like, a little weirded out because uh, of just like how, um, you know, uh, what would be the word like punctilious everyone was being, you know, like there, I was doing data entry and some, you know, well, what do I do? Do I check this box or not? And suddenly there'd be four people behind me all trying to figure out what do we do in this case? Do we check that box? Like, how do we make this methodical? And it wasn't until later that I realized what they're actually doing was just trying to get the system so streamlined that they could make a case to the state that they needed, you know, bigger allotment, that they could, they could deliver these doses. And that's what they did. And they just kept getting bigger and bigger allotment until now we're doing, you know, what in this community qualifies as a mass vaccination clinic. I think we're going to be doing 1300 doses both on Saturday and Sunday. It's, you know, happening every weekend. They've got a mobile clinic or a couple of different people who are, you know, the mobile clinics who are going to wow. people's homes who can't, can't make it there. Uh, there's a second site now that the Bainbridge Repairs and this partnership is also staffing in a, in a neighboring county to try to spread the, you know, spread that work outward to. Um, so I'm really impressed. You know, I, mean, I think it's like it definitely has everything to do with, you know, we're a, a fairly privileged community. We have a lot of, you know, retired people who can who can do this. You know, we have a lot of well-educated people who have relevant experience to make this 
make this work. Um, so, you know, we're at least, you know, we're trying to leverage all those advantages, I guess. Um, we've got a, com a community, you know, this uh, local pharmacy is handling all that end of it, the Bainbridge Community Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just been, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's just like, it's the one thing that I feel like I'll be able to point to after all this and feel some sense of pride, even though, you know, I can't claim to have any you know, huge role in it, but just to be there, you know, entering people's medical information every weekend is um, yeah. great. And, and to see people, you know, to just see other people and help them is just right. a really, really powerful thing. We're almost up on time, but um, maybe you can just give us a, a little preview. What's next for you? What, what projects oh. maybe if you don't have to reveal anything, but I mean, even what you were just describing, it's, uh, yeah. There could be some great journalism about these kinds of sites where people are coming together and and interacting and being pro-social in the midst of disaster a vaccination effort, for example, that would be one of them. What are you working on? Yeah, you know, I mean, the truth is like I've not been working on much. You know, I you know, I'm part of a of a, a dual um income household. Is that what the term? Like, you know, both my wife and I work and um yeah. you know, with um with the timing of the finishing the book when I did, and I had another big project that I finished over the summer or early fall. And after that, it's just, you know, um, basically I have, a, you know, a couple of days of, of work time a week, um, you know, sporadically. So, so yeah, I'm one of the, um, I'm one of those people you, you, one of those parents you read about, I guess, who's had to kind of downshift their, their career, but I've been pushing the ball forward on a couple of different projects and it's, it's been, um, you know, it's, it's actually been in retrospect, like kind of interesting to, to just give myself permission and have the ability, you know, financially after finishing these other projects to not feel great pressure, you know, it's not the pressure that put me off, but, um, but that's been, that's been interesting. And so it's, I think it's like, I'm definitely sort of looking toward different kinds of projects than I might've been if I hadn't kind of been floating in that, in that weird mm. space. So we'll see, I don't know. I'm, I am now very eager, you know, at first I was really enjoying and taking great pride and, you know, I'm stepping up as a, as a family guy. And I, you know, it was every second with my kids was I'm going to, I'm really so happy I spent this time with them. And at this point, I'm definitely, there's this atrophied part of myself that is clawing to get back out. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be hopefully a, a more productive second half of 2021. You know, I never thought I would say this, but I actually miss academic meetings now. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you spend part of your career getting into those meetings and then you spend another part of your career trying to get out of those meetings. And then now, and I wonder if you feel the same way as a working journalist. I'm like, um, you know, I will never look askance again at the opportunity to go to a, uh, a dingy coffee shop and interview somebody. That's the way I feel like, like a, I really value those things now. I don't want to do as much of that as I was before. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to spend as much time in the archives as I did before, but there is this part of me that misses that. And I wonder, you must, as a work, as a journalist, you must. Feel yeah. Sad. I mean, I think it's a little different because most of my time, you know, is spent working alone anyway. And so I've always kind of had a hunger. Like I've always wanted to be, you know, in an office. There's always been part of me that felt like that was really cool. And this kind of thing that I didn't have access to. So I think it's definitely intensified now, you know? Um, yeah, yeah I, I definitely, I was, I was never really complained about, you know, being on the long flight to go somewhere interesting. And I certainly am not going to do it, do it now. Just a reminder, you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls live every weekday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. I've been talking today with John Wallam, a uh, writer um, on many different topics. His most recent book out now in paperback is This Is Chance, The Shaking of an American City, A Voice That Held It Together. You definitely want to pick up that book. And just um, also a reminder, tomorrow COVID calls will be talking with vaccine researcher from Oxford University, Samantha Vanderslot. So be sure to join me for that. Um, John, thanks a million for your time. Wide ranging, really fun conversation today. Thanks. Yeah, I was thrilled to do it. Thank you, Scott. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at 530.